So I haven't, I haven't really prepared much of a, a talk today. I have a lot of notes. Uh, I took the train here from London a couple of days ago because I'm a bit scared of flying. So I've been writing this talk on the, on the, on the train um, and in restaurants. And uh, I think people have been a bit creeped out by me, like sitting in their restaurants just writing notes. Um, if you can't see it, don't worry, there's not really any slides. It's just me talking. <coughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess I should probably say who I am. Uh, I work for Eighth Light in London. Uh, and a lot of my focus in my job has been uh, thinking about diversity and inclusion in my work. Although I'm a software developer, I write code all day. Um, and some of my colleagues are here today as well, so that means I have to cut out about half my talk that I was going <laughs> to tell stories about them. So, <laughs> so yeah, this talk's only going to be about 20 minutes now. Um, <laughs> no, it's a joke. Uh, so <laughs> let's see. Uh, yeah, so who here, out of everybody, who would say they're a member of the craftsmanship community? Yeah, so you all are kind of aware of the concepts behind craftsmanship and what our values are. Uh, and that's what I want to dissect a little bit today. And uh, the, the kind of brief version of this is we're going to look at what's helping us and what isn't helping us, and what I think we need to remove and change to go forward with. Uh, so it's a bit of a retrospective. And if you, I would I'd actually quite like to make this a bit of a discussion towards the end, so I'll try to go fast. And if you've got questions, write them down, and then we can talk about them afterwards. Um, so there's a question about uh, why, why we're here. And I think, for me, uh, one of the core ideals of craftsmanship is this lifelong learning, that we are here and we really don't know anything about what we're doing, and we constantly need to learn and figure out what's new and what's important and bring new ideas from other people into the community and into our lives. And that's quite different from what's standard in uh, technology. Uh, often, uh, people come out of university and that, that's it. They've learned everything. They know everything there is to know about computer science. And they might pick up a new framework or two. But generally, they think they know everything there is to know by the time they're done with their education. And with craftsmanship, we're kind of saying, well, you know, actually, there's a whole lot we really need to f keep learning and keep practicing and keep getting better at. Uh, so that, that's kind of part of the, the background of this talk. Um, for me, I think the reason why I'm so concerned about diversity and inclusion is because I'm concerned about the relevance of our community and the growth of our community. I'm probably someone who believes that uh, growth is the opposite of, um, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, death in a way of a community. So if we don't want to uh, die as a community, we need to grow. You can't just remain stagnant. There's no such thing as really stagnant. You can't just continue on. And I think we're, there's some symptoms of that already. So, uh, for example, if you look at the communities which are growing and, and becoming quite huge, there are very specific communities like Node, communities are quite big, or may maybe perhaps uh, you look at uh, uh, meetups for uh, women or any sort of marginalized group. These are communities which are really getting a lot of input. And craftsmanship communities you know, aren't really going anywhere. So we have a, an issue with branding. And uh, I've started to look at that through the lens of diversity and inclusion. And hopefully what I'll do today is give you some ideas about um, how you can start to think about this and improve it as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's talk about professionalism. So who, uh, who, this, oh, wow, you really can't see anything, can you? Uh, <laughs> that's fine, it's just a photo, it doesn't matter. Um, so any idea, what, what does professionalism mean to you. Anybody want to suggest anything? To do the best work possible. Yeah. To do the best work possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are concerned about the, the things that you will be. Yeah. 
What do you mean in it as a professional? So concern about what you're building. Is that from an ethical point of view or uh, like pride or? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, so that's a big part of our community too is professionalism. This idea that we're not just sat in a corner being moody, you know, that kind of Hollywood stereotype of what a programmer is. Um, we're actually something more. We're human beings. We've got to interact with the world and. Maybe to be honest with the job. Yeah, honesty. Honest. Yes, absolutely. Quality, but it's important to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's an interesting one because uh, I, I think we always have to ask ourselves, are we being honest with ourselves as well? Are we being transparent with others about what we're doing? Um, and I think there's a lot of cases recently where people aren't necessarily honest about what they're doing um, or their motives for what they're doing. So uh, you, you, craftsmanship traditionally has had uh, a little bit of an image problem when people think of us as elitist, for example. And we're not always very honest about that. Um, we, we talk about being humble, and we say we've got humility. And actually, in that actual fact, a lot of the time we, you know, we turn our noses up at, uh, at people who don't TDD, or people who don't use the latest frameworks, or um, people who don't pair, these kind of things. So, um, yeah, this is again this kind of thing where you have to retrospect in your own behavior and what you think the community is behaving like. Um, and that is where I come from with professionalism. I think there's a, a very old meaning, a traditional meaning of professionalism, which is kind of what we've talked about. And uh, I think there's a more, a newer meaning, um, which is, I guess, what I'll go into. Um, something I heard. I've heard a few times recently is this idea that professionalism uh, has always been around and I, what it actually means is uh, leaving your self at home. You don't, you don't bring your personal life to work, you just act in a very professional manner and often people talk about this in the context of, uh, uh, of complaints from diverse groups for example. So you might hear people complain about um, uh, you know, harassment in the workplace or Maybe it could be something rel relatively simple like uh, childcare or uh, you know um, coming out in the workplace if you're if you're gay, and these are things that for some people are not professional. You should just leave that at home. You should it's not part of your work life. You know you come to work to write code and build a product, and that's what you should do in your work time. Um, and so that that's kind of the idea that I think. Is, is wrong, one of the ideas I think is wrong. This, that thought of you know, leaving yourself at home, and actually what you need to do is uh, bring your whole self instead. And that's probably what the industry doesn't do very well. Maybe if you work for a startup, everybody knows each other very personally. And you, you, know, you, you work hard together, you play hard together. Larger companies, probably not so much. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who here works for a large uh, corporate. I, I mean, yeah, I, I used to work in a large bank, and definitely it was very leave yourself at home. Um, and you know, uh, for me as a as a gay man, I, I never uh, I never came out, and I, I worked there for four years. I just was not who I really w was at home. And how how did that affect me? Well, you know, I think uh, it probably added to stress for me. So I think when, when people aren't their whole, whole selves, you probably see things like anxiety and stress come out. <coughs> if they have problems at home, for example, and they can't release with their colleagues, and then they have the stress of work on top of that, it's not a, not a great place to be in mentally. So bringing your whole self is important to, uh, you know, having that release and having a stability of mind and knowing you can rely on your colleagues for support when you need them. Um, and there's a whole host of associated things that we talk about, like imposter syndrome, which is something that, you know, if we just accepted people for who they were and uh, really got to know people and let them know it's okay to be whoever you are right at this moment, then maybe they would feel less of an imposter. You know, and, and, and if you think about your workplace as somewhere where there's some very, very good, knowledgeable, experienced programmers 
and then maybe some junior programmers. What is it that the experienced programmers are doing to make the junior people feel they fit in? Are they doing anything? Probably not, because in our industry, we don't put that effort in. It's this, the mature engineers are not told, you need to look after the junior people here. You need to be making sure everybody's okay. So, you know, when I think about professionalism, I'm thinking, well, that's what professionalism is. It's making sure everybody's okay and looked after, respected, um, and enjoying themselves. Uh, I was at a conference once, and uh, the, there was a talk about um, uh, culture, and the idea was that culture is simple. You just have to make sure everybody's happy. And then the, the, the person presenting said, well, here's how we make people happy. We have beers on Fridays. We have foosball table. We go out and play games together. You know, and th their idea of happiness was very fixed to one type of person. It was an idea that, well, if you are this person who likes beers and likes table football and likes all these things, then yes, you're going to be happy here. But there wasn't an awareness that happiness is different things for different people. And you know, to be a professional means where well, you're going to look at who everybody is and really work to understand what makes them happy. And this is totally removed from what professionalism is if you read traditional craftsmanship materials. It's not it's, you know, making people happy or making people uh, want to be at work is just you know, it's too wishy-washy for people. But I think now we're starting to find the language to talk about it. And people have enough experiences of their own to understand what it, what's important there. Um, uh, one of the things I, uh, a tool that I found useful recently was uh, understanding different personality types. So things like Myers-Briggs type indicator, uh, the big five personality traits. And these are things which uh, software developers uh, uh, are often criticized, or people think of them as a joke. Um, but it can be a useful tool to start to open your eyes to how people are different. So I don't know if you know much about uh, Myers-Briggs, but it kind of splits people into different axes. Um, and one of them is, are you uh, a kind of rational thought person or are you a feeling person? And what that means is, do you make your decisions based on f facts uh, uh, or do you make it based on how you and other people feel? And actually, you know, people operate in a different way, uh, in very different ways on that axis. Um, and I always find it interesting, and again, this is what our community does, people like to bring things back to rational thought all the time. And this isn't helpful to anybody who thinks in a different way. If the rational thought is not the most important thing to them, then they're not necessarily going to reach the same conclusion. But a lot of the craftsmanship community is kind of fixated on this idea of rational thought. And uh, so again, that's something that I think you know, isn't necessarily professional, to not believe that there's a diversity of opinion. Um, I'm kind of curious that neither you nor anybody mentioned the real meaning of the word professionalism, oh, go. being skilled or uh, proficient in what you do. So the, you're saying that the, kind of like, yeah, let me just. That, 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 that's what professionalism really is. Yeah, so you're saying the, the meaning is that your skills in your profession. Skilled yep. and proficient in what you do. Right? Yep. So yep. Kind of, I'm just curious that that's not one of the things you mentioned. This is I, yeah. Well, so I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't disagree with what I'm saying in the sense that what I'm saying is our profession is not about code, it's about people. If, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, how, what do you think about that? No, no, I, I fully agree with everything yeah. you just said. It's yeah. kind of like, uh, it's still okay, very important aspects and all those things, but professionalism yeah. as a word is about whether you are or you're not skilled yes. in what you do. Yep. Kind of as if we are mixing terms. Yeah. I, give impression. Um, I think people get uh, caught up in, you know, when they when they read about software craftsmanship and they read, well, this is what professionalism is, and then they're suddenly fixated on this, in this box of professionalism of that this is what I must be, and they don't stop to think about other aspects that might possibly be part of that or related to that is, is, kind, of, is kind of my point. So, you know, I, I definitely look at my work as uh, 
a, being a people person and understanding people. And for many of us, I'll come to this later, um, you know, many of us have technical proficiency. We spent years becoming technically proficient. You know, I, I write Ruby and JavaScript all day long, and you know, I have experience with C Sharp and C++ and all sorts. But that's not what I'm learning about at the moment. I'm learning about the people stuff. And it's maybe a shame that that comes after for everybody. Um, and uh, I, I guess a key skill is listening. You know, if you were to take anything from this, it would be just listen more. Listen to the people around you. Stop trying to profess about things like I'm doing now. But uh, you know, listen to, listen to your teammates. Um, uh, and uh, vulnerability is important. I don't know if you've heard of the idea of you need to be vulnerable as a team. You need to be vulnerable as yourself in order to have a successful team, which means you need to be uh, happy to make mistakes. And when you do make a mistake, own up to it. Um, you need to support <coughs> others in your team when they make mistakes. So maybe that comes back to imposter syndrome that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you, some people suffer that because they're afraid of making mistakes or afraid that they don't actually know everything. So you, professionalism also to me is this culture of vulnerability where it's, it's okay to make mistakes and be supported. Um, and we actually do that, I guess, quite well with craftsmanship uh, when we look at apprenticeships and this idea of lifelong learning. It's this, uh, it, that is at, at its root. That we just don't know everything there is to know. And so that's a, a key idea that we probably should bring forward into this new professionalism. Uh, okay, I wanted to mention some examples or ask your thoughts on uh, some things which uh, I guess I want to ask, are these professional? So uh, what about working remotely? Is there a so remotely? Remote. Yeah. So is there an issue of professionalism if you, let's say, always work remote? And I ask this because, for example, a lot of large organizations now ban working remotely because they perceive it as something that is, they're not going to get the most productivity out of their with their workforce. I think that they are not going to get uh, as much productivity because they're not ready for that kind of. Not because it doesn't work or it's not. You cannot be as productive, but it doesn't fit. You know the the, the, the behavior that you're trying to put in the organization doesn't fit with what the organization is. So it doesn't fit with the so culture of the organization. They yeah. are, you know, uh, they, it doesn't fit with their mm -hmm. mind. Uh, Mindset, right. Like, so they're kind of right. About yep. that. Yeah. Yes. But it's, it doesn't mean that it's not useful or you cannot get the same amount of productivity, I would say. Okay, so you're saying that for these companies it's potentially for they, not. For them, yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. They would need to change a lot of other stuff in order for yeah. that to be able to. So I think my question then is you know, if you do you see craftsmanship as something for smaller companies or is it something that can actually apply to the larger organizations? which? have a culture which is not necessarily about craftsmanship but, uh, or professionalism, but how does that, does it, does it scale, right? Uh, it, does apply, it, it does apply, but they, they need a big change of culture. That, mm -hmm. it, that is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that it does apply, it would work, but the problem is that there is a status quo, a way of working already. Mm -hmm. This way of working is not aligned with this kind, this kind of values. So it's very hard to have uh, big companies or lots of people in general uh, make these huge changes. Mm -hmm. So it would work, but uh, any minority movement, it's always harder to become mainstream. My, my point of view on that is it, it works as long as the values of the organization, the, the already uh, set, the established mindset is aligned with what you're trying to do. Because yep. then you can change the practices, change whatever you know, yep. remotely, parent, blah, blah. But if the underlying system for that is not there, then you're going to have the plan. Right. That's, that's, and there, right. because of the way that most organizations are built, those, those value systems are not there. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's why they have so much trouble adapting. And will most likely never be. 
<laughs> well, that's that's the that's the question, right? How do we how do we grow? How do we change culture? How do we? In some yeah. cases, I mean, uh, my conclusion is simply in, in many cases, big enterprises simply you try for three years and you realize <laughs> it's not going to happen. So you're it's defeated. Gonna, okay. It's more likely <laughs> that company is going to become yeah. new. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's probably why a lot of us come to craftsmanship or craftsmanship companies because we've seen that we've tried to change we've tried to do something better and we've repeatedly failed at that so we join somewhere which has this culture at heart yeah what do you think about it? I'm up about if it applies to bigger companies? well I'm up for the challenge I think this is so I asked this I said to the start I said at the start that craftsmanship I think has to answer the questions about relevancy and growth and I think these are the sort of things that we need to start answering if we want to remain relevant. It definitely so. applies to big companies because you have as many examples of big companies as you want. It's not about size. Yeah. I think size is irrelevant. It's kind of just apply to a company that doesn't care about the, you know, yeah, exactly. mm. so, and, and if the question is would it ever apply, I think it, it could. Like you can actually change that culture. It's just not going to happen overnight. Yep. It's, a long it's going to take uh, a lot of Absolutely. Uh, you know, effort and a lot of people to get involved into that, especially in yep. leadership at yep. all levels of the organization. So, yep. And that's where most companies fail because they have these this unrealistic expectations of, okay, this is cool, you know, these other companies are doing it, let's, let's try it ourselves, but they are not willing to change that yep. mindset. And that's what they, oh, it doesn't work. No, yep. it doesn't work. Uh, you didn't see beyond what the practice or the, the, the tools that you were trying to put into place are, right? Right. Because we are talking about big companies that they, but big companies are us. So as for if all the programmers are uh, involved in the programmatic culture, then this will change because I will not work if they don't have this culture. And if everyone is aligned with this, then uh, leaders will have to, uh, to accept that. I disagree with that strongly. Mm -hmm. I've tried for many years with approach bottom-up, huh? and every single time, if you're talking about bigger entities, right? every single time it fails, because until you get the pie out, but real one, not kind of like, yeah, I want everybody to be agile seven level below. But until you get by out, you will hit the ceiling and fail. And you, you're going to hit it again and fail and fail and fail and fail. Because there are barriers that you cannot remove from that. that that's my kind of... I, I think that, let's yeah, move... Not unlimited, so it's, I'm not talking about the world. But my, my impression is kind of like... I, yeah. You cannot remove the barriers without from down. I really recognize your, your viewpoint a lot. I think a lot of us come from that place. Um, I want to move on, so, but this is perhaps a great conversation for the open space tomorrow. Yeah, so let's, let's do that, actually. Um, so I want to talk about something that I think we really do right, which is hiring uh, through apprenticeships. Um, and, and again, retrospective about is this working for us? Uh, is it relevant? Does it affect how we grow? Um, you know, I, I remember my first job I got out of university, uh, you know, I was really lucky because I went to a great university and uh, I remember my boss at the time said, you know, your CV was just at the top of the pile because they're advertising for graduate software developers and they get hundreds if not thousands of CVs come in because thousands and thousands of people graduate from computer science degrees every year and they all apply for the same jobs. And then, you know, this company had two spaces and they got a thousand CVs, something like that. All they do is sort them by your university and your grades and your exam results. And then they just look at the, the top ones. Um, and so I was really lucky. But, you know, we have a great answer to that with craftsmanship, which is that, well, we don't really care at all what you've done before. We care about judging you today. So come in and write some code with us, show us your portfolio or, you know, talk to us about your attitude. And this is actually great for, uh, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion. It's great for that. It's great for getting people who are career changers. It's great for getting people who didn't necessarily have the chance to go to university. But it's a slower process. So you, 
actually have to evaluate a lot more people. So that's definitely inhibiting growth, right? Um, so one of the things we've seen su success with uh, Airflight recently is getting involved in uh, meetups um, and, uh, um, and, and uh, sponsoring events, accessing other people that way. So when we're hiring people, we form relationships with people on a very informal basis. We don't say to people, uh, okay, you've got to apply on our website and then come in and we'll go through this entire very long interview process, <coughs> which is what we used to do. We used to say, okay, fill in this stuff about yourself and then do this coding challenge and then we'll review it and you give us feedback and blah, 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 blah. It actually takes a long time for people that you don't know anything about. So what we do now is we, well, we go to meetups and we get to know people individually and they get to know us and we don't necessarily have to do any work other than having a chat with them in an evening. And then over time, they might want to apply for us. And by that stage, they've already either got a very good chance of applying or they've realized it's not a good fit and haven't applied. So we've started to have some good success with this. And I would say you know, if the problem is hiring via the craftsmanship methods takes a long time. Then this is a, a route to do it in a much easier way. And of course, meetups. And this is the logo for uh, Queer Code London which is a meetup uh, I co-founded. Um, and we fired two people through that meetup. Um, and you know, that was a surprise to me. When I started the meetup, I didn't think we were going to hire people. It happened just so naturally almost. Um, and, and there are so many meetups out there and so many for marginalized groups. Um, and it's quite interesting. I said earlier that. Uh, the biggest communities that are growing are things like Node and for uh, women and, and marginalized groups. They're very specific focused, right? And craftsmanship is not specific focused at all. It's very generalist. And I think when we talk about our branding or are we growing, that's one of our issues. We're very, very broad in what we do. Nobody kind of says, oh, well, I'm going to go to a craftsmanship meetup. Like we obviously have. Right? But the general population isn't really looking for that. They go on to meet up and they find the technology they're using. And I know uh, I've talked to my colleagues about that experience of when we go to meetups and you meet somebody new and you're networking and they ask you, well, what language do you work with? And you will say, well, you know, few, a lot. And it's very confusing for people when you say you're a generalist. It's just not how normal people, normal people, like the people in the wider industry, work, they are Node developers, or they're React developers. You know, they've got this very specific thing. And if you tell them you're a generalist, it doesn't really compute. So here's where there's, a, for us, again, a relevancy issue. And uh, what I've found with my work with Queer Code is that you know, we can get involved in these meetups. You know, that is a, a software craftsmanship meetup. It was formed by me and somebody else, uh, Franzi, from, who you may know from the software craftsmanship community. And uh, that it's software crafts there. It's just not the main thing. And that's true for a lot of meetups. And a lot of the, the companies who work in the craftsmanship space are sponsoring meetups. They're uh, providing coaches at meetups. So they're there in the background. And I think this is a real route for us, not just for hiring, but also growth to get the word for a software craftsmanship out there. Um, I'll come back to that, uh, that point. Um, I think, the, the, well, the final thing I probably wanted to say is that, uh, you know, we, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be uh, growing and more relevant when it comes to the, the wider jobs market. If you're a graduate, there's a lot of jobs out there for the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, and FinTech. And often you'll see the job adverts for these companies say, oh, you'll get to work on interesting and difficult problems. And I always find that kind of amusing because that if you go to work for Facebook on a very high salary, fresh out of uni, you know, you're going to be working on very stagnant stuff. Like Facebook have their product. They're, all you're doing is maintaining the system. Uh, so they say interesting and difficult problems. I mean, they're going to be interesting and difficult in a very sort of minute problem space. Uh, and, uh, you know, with craftsmanship, we kind of have a much bigger worldview. So why can't we compete with that message? You know, with our apprenticeship model, the work we do with meeting uh, new hires through meetups, 
we should be able to say, no, the work we do is more interesting. We're creating new systems. Uh, we're developing new ideas. And that's completely at odds with what the biggest employers like Facebook and Google are doing. And remember, they're reliant on this kind of CV approach of sorting the CVs by grades and university. So, you know, the ideas are there, but we haven't really, I don't feel like we've really uncovered all of them yet. So yeah, moving on, I want to talk about codes of conduct. Um, and I'll go through this briefly, because uh, I'm kind of running out of time. <laughs> Code of conduct, very simply, uh, don't be a jerk for your definition of what a jerk is. Right? So you know, they, they should be very short pieces of information. And they'd say, you know, kind of, this is what is allowed in this community. And if you don't follow these rules, then goodbye. It's as simple as that. And you know, they'll, they'll, they'll probably tell you how to lodge a complaint if you have a complaint. Um, you know, this is such a big idea. Um, and even if you go on GitHub now, you can apply them to your code repositories. So in open source, it's very, very important that you have a code of conduct on your repositories. It's like a license. It's just as important as a license. So you can, GitHub will provide one for you. Um, and you should definitely do that on all of your code bases, even if it doesn't, if it's on GitHub and you accept contributions, you should have a code of conduct. And, and, and you should have them for your communities as well. Um, and in fact, at most of the craftsmanship events do have these, uh, these code of conducts. And again, it comes back to the idea of uh, relevancy. You know, we in, in the craftsmanship community, we talk about professionalism and how we should be respectful of each other. But the rest of the industry is talking about codes of conduct. They don't talk about professionalism. They talk about codes of conduct. But they're very related ideas. Um, and, and so you know, why are we not following this language? And I'll come on to this point in a little bit. But you know, there's, again, there's, there's this elitism of craftsmanship where we think we have the best ideas. But the industry is somewhere totally else. It's somewhere you know, far off. Like codes of conduct is just, you know, you won't read about that in the craftsmanship literature. But yet the most uh, kind of modern craftsmen are, are actually doing these things. Um, OK, I'm going to go on. So name, naming's hard, right? Like this is one of the, the lessons we have. Uh, from all of our technical training, naming is very hard. And the, the biggest thing here really is that there are a lot of us who no longer use the word craftsmanship. I know I've been using it throughout this talk, but I don't use it at all really. Um, I talk about the software craft community, and that has been a big change uh, for a number of us. It's very simple to do, actually. You might think changing the name is very hard, but it's very simple. You just say, Instead of saying, oh, I'm a member of the software craftsmanship community, you say, I'm a member of the software craft community. And instead of saying, I'm a software craftsman, you say, I'm a software crafter. It's very simple to do. And it's an individual choice we can all make. Um, and I think you should all make it. And the, you know, the reason why is, uh, that first of all, there's the man in the middle problem. The fact that it's got man in there, which is, you, know, you might laugh, but you know, this is a problem for a lot of people. Um, and, and our community does have an issue of image. It does have this, people do think of it as this kind of crafty thing for like old white men. And it's not that, you know, if you go to any of the Socrates events, you'll, you'll kind of know that uh, we can do better definitely with diversity, but we're really not doing ourselves any favors by aligning ourselves to the medieval guilds of craftsmanship, which were traditionally, you know, for men and very sort of male focused um, yeah, I, I think the elitism here is also fundamental to this issue. I, I guess what I'm proposing is that when you say software craft, you're removing that elitism as well. So the things that we hold dear to us that I think are important, things like apprenticeship uh, and lifelong learning, they don't really have anything to do with craftsmanship. But I think there is a case for saying, well, we can form a movement called software craft, which maintains all of those ideas and removes all of the crafty ideas that, stop, that are holding us back. And I think that's, again, the individual choice. You can just start saying it, start using those words. Um, it's, naming's hard, 
but we know how to get this right now. Like we, there are enough people who are making this change to do this. Uh, let me see. I actually had notes on this. <laughs> yeah, so the Socrates events have done it. Uh, the Slack group, I don't know if you're in the Software Crafters Slack. And maybe you noticed it used to be the Software Craftsmanship Slack, and now it's the Software Crafters Slack. <coughs> the website changed. Um, all of the people who kind of run that community have made that change very quietly, and it was very easy. It was just a kind of group decision. Um, and I, I think probably a lot of it came from the Socrates community. If you think about our community as craftsmanship, we have a, 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 a big culture, and it's big enough to support subcultures. Uh, if you go to a Socrates event, you probably meet a lot of people you already know from previous events who are interested in the same things. It might be TDD, you know, classical TDD, or Mocus TDD, it might be uh, Elm or JavaScript, whatever it is, you've got your subculture. And that the events I've been going to recently, I'm definitely involved quite heavily in the, the kind of diversity and inclusion subculture. And these people are thinking really hard about why our events are so male-oriented, or why they're so white. Um, and we ask, we're thinking about those problems. So you can be involved in your subcultures about you know, TDD and your languages, and you know, whatever, you, whatever you want. But there are some people in the community who are working hard to figure these answers out. And when they come with recommendations, it's like you know, they're kind of being your personal brand consultants. You know, if they say to you, oh, you know, we think we should change the name because it's really problematic name, um, you know, it, you'd do well to kind of take that advice and listen to it because these people have been meeting again and again and again regularly and coming up with ideas. And we're at the point where we think we really have a way forward. And it's a way forward that supports our relevancy and supports our growth into the future. To, to go back to that point about meetups like Node and uh, meetups for uh, women here in code, these are the ones which are growing. And if we, what we feel is that if we don't change, we are no longer going to be relevant. It's not like the ideas we have about how we learn and, and TDD and refactoring, XP, all these kind of things we value, they are still relevant. But if we don't get rid of the bits of our you know, community personality that are harmful, then we'll no longer be relevant. Yeah. Um, I have a bit here about um, uh, journeyman, um, which is probably worth mentioning. And that's another part of the culture that is a little bit problematic. I was thinking about this uh, a lot recently. You know, we promote this idea of journeyman uh, and, and uh, uh, the fact that as developers who are skilled and knowledgeable and everything and great generalists, we can go around the world and just pitch up at different companies and do some contract work and you know, move around the, the globe as this kind of journeyman per person learning our craft, practicing our craft, uh, refining our craft. And I was thinking about, wow, how much sort of male privilege is, is associated with that idea? You know, we're in a space where uh, there is constantly news about harassment um, of women at conferences, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of events, uh, meetups, at companies around the world where uh, harassment is still a huge issue, and yet we're talking about the journeyman like it's such an easy thing to do. And this is a, such a good example of where craftsmanship is totally off mark. You know, the rest of the world is talking about how hard it is for women to, uh, to, to get anywhere in our industry, and we're talking about how easy it is to just move around the globe and practice our skills. So, you know, that's another idea that I think is totally useless to us. Let's just get rid of it. And that's kind of supported by the change in name. So saying, well, we're a software craft movement, not a craftsmanship movement. We're again getting rid of that idea of medieval craftsman guilds. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. Can you read this? Okay. So this is just, I just wanted to finish on you know, a comparison of the manifesto. So obviously, there, I said there's a group of people who want to change the name. And if you change the name, you kind of have to change the manifesto. And uh, I don't know if you're very familiar with the manifesto. On the left, I've got the Agile manifesto. And on the right, the Craftsmanship manifesto. I think this also is quite 
grandiose. It's quite elitist. Do we even need a manifesto is what I'm asking you. I mean, you can compare the language. I think when you look at the agile manifesto, a lot of it makes sense. You know, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That's things like saying, well, rather than just record everything in Jira, we'll just have a conversation about what's your newest bug, something like that. Um, you know, working software with comprehensive documentation. For, for those of us who've worked in uh, you know, non-agile environments and spent years like, writing huge documentation, this is kind of a revelation. And to see it written down, you know exactly what it means. Um, same with customer collaboration, responding to change. You know, this, is, this is big if you're used to waterfall style of working. Um, and then we go to the craftsmanship manifesto. You know, my favorite is like, not only customer collaboration, but also <coughs> productive partnerships. Right, what does that even mean? Does, <laughs> do you, do you, I mean, I'd, I'd ask you, but you know, there's a serious, it's kind of a, kind of a joke, but it's serious. You know, this is, a, people call us elitist. This is why, like, what does this even mean? It doesn't really have a meaning beyond, uh, you know, this customer collaboration. You know, people know, kind of have an idea. You might not be working in an environment where you're dealing with your own clients, but you'd know what this means. Just having a better working relationship with your customers. But you know, what, is it, what does that add? I don't know if it adds anything. Um, you know, our, you, our community is definitely important, right? It's definitely important. I mean, steadily adding value, okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't really say much. So, um, you know, my point of this slide is not that this is terrible. Obviously, it's got us very far. A lot of us have probably signed it. But now that we're changing the name, we've got a chance also to come up with something new here. And this is a conversation that's going on at the moment. And you, if you join the Software Crafters Slack, you can just join this conversation as well. Um, and I think it should be based on our values. And I, I don't know what those values are, but what, I guess my suggestion through all of this talk has been, that's what I'd like you to start thinking about, is what are these values which are important to us? And what are relevant to today's industry. OK, so yeah, just a summary of everything I talked about. Um, you know, growth and relevancy, uh, that's very important to me. And I think it should be important to all of us. Some of us are trying to act like brand consultants and tell you, well, hey, these are the things we think we need to change. Uh, so what are our real values? Um, hopefully, what I've talked about has helped you see how I think about things. Not saying that they're all the right answers or even close to a complete set of answers, but it would be great if it helped frame your thinking. And when you look at the things you hear in craftsmanship events, hopefully it will help you come up with your own ideas. So getting rid of whatever holds us back um, and focusing on what is good and what we want to keep from our culture, um, particularly around professionalism. What is that? You know, there's a whole it really. Uh, I find it ironic when people who claim to be professionals go online. You know, Twitter is a great platform for this and be very unprofessional, what I consider unprofessional, and yet they're, they're claiming that they're professionals. So uh, yeah, that's a you know, continued conversation. Uh, getting involved in the wider community meetups. This is such a fantastic way to spread our message. And it doesn't need to be all about like, craftsmanship, craftsmanship at the fore. It can just be you know, helping sponsor or host events. And yeah, uh, listen to those who care about branding. That's me. <laughs> no, no. Cool. Uh, thanks. Um, any anybody want to? We've got ten minutes. If you wanna ha any questions or comments, discussion? That that um, way of of hiring does it scale? <laughs> because we are in that. Does it scale? Right yeah. Very complicated. Wait, so what do you, what, go I on. mean, um, going through the meetup path mm -hmm. to, to find people that fits the company culture or, or I think it's, we are from Valencia, it's a small city here in Spain, and for us it's quite difficult. I think those ideas work, but in environments when, where you have a lot of fish to, to mm -hmm. catch, 
every situation. So we, we need to walk the uh, craftsman path to hiring with the yep. point of view and with the exercise and everything. Yeah, mm. yeah. So you want to say you live in a small place and you need to hire everybody who lives there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you say. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, it's just important that we think about these ideas because I think some people come to craftsmanship and they read the book on how apprenticeship should be and then that's it, this is how we do it. But that's never going to help growth or it's not doesn't provide answers for bigger companies. So we need to start looking for the ideas that are, that are helping us. And the approach I've shown is just what my experience is. It's not, you know, it's just my experience. I don't have any statistics or facts for you on that. In that Just case, maybe we can start non-technical non people, we can teach them how yeah. to program or things like that. I mean, if you get a small pool of people where you are, that means that you should start considering your work. We are not going to... We are not the ones who are still going to come. Yes. So, you know, I, I took some notes of the, was there some, I definitely agree with most of what you're uh, saying there, but there are certain things that, you know, I guess it would be interesting to clarify a little bit because, for instance, you mentioned Mayor's Briggs as a great way to uh, you know, understand a little bit better the different kinds of people that, that you will have mm. in the team or in the company. Mm. But you could also fall into typecasting because in the end that's what it is, you know, when you yep. do the test, oh this is the rational guy, oh this is the emotional yep. guy. And the truth is that we although sometimes we may have behaviors that we use most, uh, mm -hmm. we react to certain situations in a specific way, that's not only who we are, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and you you know, because I've seen this also, right? It's like mm. when we're thinking about who are we going to promote for a specific role? Or when, you know, oh, this role wouldn't fit because this guy is like, but maybe he's perfectly capable of, of doing the job. But just, yeah. that's, that's something right. to be careful uh, with. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's a great tool for self-discovery. Yeah. In a sense, you know, it makes explicit something that you already know, but you're not, right? And also in teams, it can help you to, to create tolerance in, in yeah. certain aspects. But then you may fall into the, okay, this is how he's going to react always. Right. And, and you sort of typecast that person as, you know, what the test said it is. Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, so your point is that, yeah, personality testing, yeah, it really has its place. Be careful about it. Yeah. Like, how do I, you use it? I completely... Because you can create sort of uh, that isolation that you want to use just more categories. Yeah. Thing, you know, instead of having, no, oh, these are the guys that, you know, being happy, he's drinking beer, uh, playing football, and yeah, and so instead yeah. of that, you'll have more. Yeah, I, I, I like agree, that. I completely agree with you. I mean, I think why I should have said was, you know, definitely don't use it for hiring, which a lot of companies do, especially the bigger employers, you know, they will look at your CV and then they'll get you to do a personality test. And you know, that's not what you want to do. Um, and it, it's, it's just a tool that has its place. And people change. Uh, yeah, and people evolve. Yeah. And you don't want to, you know, yeah. That from that. yeah. 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 So I definitely, there's definitely a caveat there. I think, you know, I, I guess what I was trying to say is, uh, it can be a useful stepping stone to understanding how to understand people. So if you're the sort of uh, developer, you know, just like I was, you spent your life writing code in a corner, you know, in a dark room. And you don't really know who anybody is or how to interact socially with people. Having some mechanism for starting to understand people is a great first step. So I, I just see it as a tool in the toolbox. I definitely would not rely on it. And I think um, there's a, you <coughs> reminded me that, you know, for me, there's just this kind of shift on a little bit. Uh, I al also see the same thing as software craft. I don't necessarily see it as this sort of grand vision of the world, which I think a lot of people come to software craftsmanship and think it uh, has an answer for everything. And, you know, Part of what I was trying to get across is that in this shift towards software craft, I'm trying to move away from that elitism, that grandiose image. It's just another tool that we have, and there's no reason why software craft can't work in tandem with, you know, 
whatever, you know, you're doing XP at work, it's just another thing like XP almost, right? Like another value. If your software craft is hosting or sponsoring a meetup, they're just, you know, it's just kind of ideal behind the meetup. So, I, yeah, again, it's another thing where I think of a, in my, mentally I think of it as a tool in the toolbox. Again, I was go, go, yeah, go ahead. If anyone wants to just help me, okay? Uh, there are other more, let's say, controversial parts of, of what you were saying, like, for instance, changing the name, etc. And I will be 100% behind changing the name if that was going to solve the problem. Because yeah. I think the changing the name moves, moves us in that direction, I would say. But uh, it's treating a symptom instead of the, mm. the real uh, problem behind it is, if people are jerks, it doesn't matter what the movement is called, they're still gonna be jerks, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. if they're being elitists, if they're being, you know, mm -hmm. non-inclusive or whatever, mm -hmm. that's going to continue happening whether you change the name or not. And yep. if for a time you get a, you know, face, face wash kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, but eventually you will catch up. <coughs> If you don't do something about the real issue, which yeah. is, you know, what kind of values are those people bringing to the movement? And, yeah. and how uh, leaders in the community and leaders in the movement react to certain behaviors? Because before we were talking about culture and all these things, culture is, is learning, it's group learning. Yeah, it's what we learn from years of, you know, history, from uh, you know, being in a company, working in a specific, that's what the culture is. And the way that you change that is by seeing, most of the time, uh, by seeing how leaders react, in, specifically in, in, in moments of crisis, let's say. So if we're at a conference and someone's being a jerk, and then, you know, the, the guy that sort of everyone looks up to joins in on the bashing or joins in on the harassment, and whatever. That's only contributing to, to yep. uh, uh, solidify those, those uh, yep. values, right? So again, I understand what the, the idea is or what has been trying to, what's, try, uh, what's been tried to be accomplished there. Really be more inclusive, really take all this uh, technical, I would say, aspects of, okay, the name, you know, it has man, it has, you know, it has this connotation with, we agree on that. It's going to help us get there. Mm -hmm. But there, that, that's a good way of ignoring all the stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, oh, let's fight this battle, and then the other stuff is still going to be there. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing? No, because you, before you mentioned, there's a sub group or a subculture of the movement, let's say, that is trying to think about this. Mm -hmm. and, okay, what else are we doing besides mm -hmm. that? Yep. You know, to treat these other things that I consider at least more important yep. in that sense. Yeah, so I think with the name and the, the, the manifesto change and these kind of things, p people c are coming at it from that angle. I guess I am presenting to you what we think of as a solution, but there's been a lot of thinking, well, what's the minimal amount of stuff we can do to get people to change that moves towards our goal, like, exactly like you say. And there are other symptoms that I think I uh, decided I didn't want to talk about today in my talk. Because they're... Yeah. The open space or whatever, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, that, it's very interesting because we were talking about it uh, in in the community. Yes. Right? Like, we absolutely. The name, etc. And again, I think yeah, we could do that. I, so I, I, so I'm not married to it, but yeah, I think. Huh? I mean, you're being very. Well, no, I, I can't. It's not saying a message. So what you mentioned. Uh, you, the change of name. Yeah. It is important, and for people who are not necessarily aware of all of the things that are going on in our community, it can definitely help. A name change helps uh, change the ideas of what a community is. Like it's just less grandiose, you know. If you say it's craft. Yeah, I, again, I don't want to. I'm not opposed to. No, no. Hey, I, but I just I, think I, I what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Yeah, I wanted to come you back know, to your point. Is that going to take us to solve that problem, or? So, we, there is one we, problem. We are taking steps to also explore the problem of coming the solution, like this talk and a lot of other talks. So, for me, it, it, we have to change the name. Is 
for this one okay. and for this is the solution that there is something is happening that there are people in the middle and there, there are people that um, yeah, I mean, no, nobody's... Uh, I think this is a conversation that we definitely need to continue at the, at the open space, yeah? Yeah. Uh, and I want to come back to your... Points, like, like, like you go on that, but I, I think... Let's, let's explore that together. You made a point about leadership that I think <coughs> would be a great one to discuss at the open space. Because okay. that's definitely one problem. Okay. Yeah. So we're done. Cool. Thanks very much, everybody.